And now a brief word about pronunciation. Agricola is the Latin word for farmer. It has four syllables and is accented on the second syllable, much like curriculum. It is not pronounced agricola. Please say after me, agricola. And now to board games with Scott. What? Oh, you again? Hi there. This is Scott Nicholson. It's a lovely day here in Syracuse. So I thought I'd come outside and enjoy the sun. And I thought I'd enjoy what's left of the summer before it all goes away. But you know, I started getting all these emails of people saying, Hey, Scott! Hey, Scott! You gotta tell us about this game! I said, What game is that? And they said, You gotta tell us about Agricola! So, here I am, out in the last remnants of the summer vacation, here to tell you how to play Agricola. This is a game that's gotten a lot of buzz, a lot of people are excited about it, and rightly so. It is a very fun game. I like it a lot. It's been out since S in 2007. Agricola is actually for one to five players. It's a solo version for it, and it takes, well, a various amount of time based upon how many people that you have. It was designed by Uwe Rosenberg and originally put out by Lookout Games, but has been recently released here in the U.S. by Z-Man Games. So you're probably eager to hear what this is all about, so let's go right into the components of the game. So, what do you get with the Gricola? Well, first you get a set of rules. And I will say as the rules go on, they start out fine, and then, boy, talk about some fine print. The last few pages of the rules here are in really, really tiny, tiny print. Oh my gosh! But, you know, I guess it was better than making a bigger rule book. I don't know, I think I prefer the bigger rule book. But, they'll explain what you do. You get a bunch of boards, and so some of the boards are used for playing, some are used for what's called the family game, which I'm not really going to talk about in this video, and also some of the boards have a little rules explanation right on them, which can be fairly handy. Just hope you don't have stuff on this side when you need to know what the rules are. But each player is going to get one of these boards to work with it during the game. Each player also gets their own fences, some stables, and discs for their family members. And then you're going to get a bunch of other types of discs. So you've got discs that represent different types of commodities here. You've got vegetables, which are the orange ones, and wheat. And then you've got reeds, and you've got brick, and you've got stone, and you've got wood. And then you get to play with blocks, and you get to play pretend that this block is a sheep. Ah, and you get to pretend that this block is a cow. Moo. And you can pretend this block is a bee. Oh, it's a boar, I believe. But if you pre-ordered the game, or if you see someone talk about Anna Meeples, these are Anna Meeples, and so these are wooden representations of those animals. So in case your imagination isn't good enough to imagine that's a sheep, then you can actually get a little wooden sheep that looks just like a sheep. So these are called Anna Meeples if you want to replace your blocks with dolls. And then you've got these cardboard chips which represent rooms in your house. So as the game goes on, you're going to expand the rooms in your house by putting these on the board. You're also going to have some markers here that help you if you run out of a certain type of something. You can use these markers to represent three or five times something. You've got these little markers here that represent food, which is a very important thing in the game. And then you have cards, 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 cards. You have over 300 cards in this game. And these cards are used for a lot of different things. There's actually several different decks in the game. And so, depending upon the level of complexity you're looking to play in the game, you've got a complex deck, and an interactive deck, and the introduction deck. These are really important. I'll talk about the cards a little bit later. You get some little score pads, which if you run out, you can print more off of from Board Game Geek. And some people have also invented some other types of scoring mechanisms on there you might want to take a look at. So the components, when you lay it all out, you're going to need a big table because everyone's going to have their own set of these and their own board and their old 14 cards they're dealing with. So you're going to need a lot of space to spread this game out. You get a lot of stuff. But how does all this work together? Well, first I'm going to give you an overview of what you're doing in Agricola. <laughs> In Agricola, you're growing a farm, and this is your farm. You'll have a board like this. And on that farm, you'll have a house, E-I-E-I-O. And so, here's your house. It's a two-room wood house. You also have you, and you have your significant other. Now, what can you do with your farm? Well, several things you can do. You can add on to your house. You can add on other spaces that make your house bigger. When you have a bigger house, you then have the room to have babies. And so, each room of the house can support one family member. You also have the ability to upgrade your house. If you get tired of that dank wood house and you want to make your house into a neato brick house, you can do that, just like that. 
You can also upgrade it one more time later on in the game to stone. And when you upgrade it, you have to upgrade your entire house. And then any new rooms you build have to be of that new type. There's no difference in the functionality of the buildings when you upgrade them. They just get you more points. Another thing you can do with your farm is you can plow the fields. And if you plow the fields, then you put these markers on. Now, notice that I'm putting all these next to each other. Once I build onto my house, I always have to extend the house from where it is orthogonally. Same thing with the fields. When I start plowing, all other plowed fields have to connect to my first plowed field. Now when I've plowed the field, I have the ability to sow stuff. I can sow vegetables, which are these orange things, because of course we sow carrots here. And I can sow wheat, which are the yellow things. And by sowing them, I'm going to put a bunch on there and I'll get one off during each harvest phase. But I'll talk about that later. The other thing you can do is you can have animals in your farm. But in order to have animals, you want to have some fences. And so these are the fences. Now, once you start fencing in spaces, all the rest of the pastures you create with these fences have to be next to where you started. And you're only going to have 15 of these sticks to work with. So you have to be careful how you use them. So that makes one big pasture. Later on in the game, I can choose to subdivide into two pastures like that. Why would I want to do that? Because only one type of animal can live in any pasture. So what the pastures do is they support animals. So if I want to get some animals, I can have one animal running around in my house as a pet. So I could say, take a sheep, and that sheep could run around my house as a pet. If the field doesn't have anything else on it, I can put a stable in the field, and that can house one animal as well. So I can have one animal out there at the stable. The pasture is where I can hold lots of animals. And in each space of a pasture, I can have two of an animal. Now I can't put sheep in there with the cows. I have to put some different animal in there. So, but I could put piggies down here in this bottom one. Now if I build a stable in a pasture, then it doubles the capacity of that pasture. So normally the pasture could hold two animals per space. This pasture could hold four, this pasture could hold eight. But let's say that I want to get more of these cows in there, I can put in a stable, and now I can add four cows per square inside that pasture. The other thing you're going to do during the game is getting these improvements. So you might choose to add a fireplace, to your property, or a cooking hearth, or a clay oven, or a joinery. And these are improvements you'll be able to add. There are also smaller, minor improvements that we'll talk a lot about later. So at the end of the game, you can look down at your farm, and you'll see your animals, and your vegetables, and your people, and the size of your farm, and any improvements you've made. And that's going to determine how well you did. So let's now talk about how you're going to assess your performance at the end of the game. <laughs> Now I found when I teach this game, it's good to teach the scoring fairly early on because that helps you put everything you're doing in context. Agricola rewards you for doing many different things instead of just a lot of the same thing. So at the end of the game, you're going to score yourself using these charts. So first you look to see how many plowed fields you have. Zero to one plowed fields, you lose a point. Two plowed fields gets you one point. Three gets you two points. Four gets you three points and five or more get you four points. And so you can have all the plowed fields you want, but you're not going to get any more than four points for the category of plowed fields. And if you don't have at least two, you're going to lose a point. You also get points for the number of separate pastures that you have, up to four. You're going to get points for the number of wheat tokens that you have. Zero minus one point. One to three is one point, four or five is two point, etc. Same with vegetables, but they're harder to get a hold of, so they get you more points. And also for sheep, for piggies, and for cows. The more of those that you have, the more points you get, up to a maximum of four in any one category. And again, if you don't have any, you lose a point. So many times it's important to get one of everything, because getting one of most things takes you from negative one to positive one points. You're also going to get points at the end of the game. If you didn't use all of your farmland, you lose one point per square you didn't use. For every fenced-in stable, you get a point. For every space in your house that you upgrade to clay, you get a point. And for every space of your house you upgraded to stone, you get two points. And again, remember, you've got to upgrade your entire house at once. And so this will be a bonus for your whole house. Finally, you get three points for every disc you have on your board. So if you make more babies, you get more points. Some of the cards will give you points. It'll show on the cards. I'll show that later. And some cards also may give you bonus points. And then you have the happy little person waving, saying, bye, thanks for playing. So that's how you score. So what's important to take away from this is that during the game you want to try and get a lot of different stuff, not just focus on a few things. But how do you do that? Well, let's talk about it. To start the game, you're going to get a board for your farm, a two-room farmhouse made of wood, two family members, three food, unless you're the starting player, in which case you only get two food, 
and then 14 cards. Seven profession cards, which give the ability to do special actions during the game and break the rules. And seven minor improvement cards, which help your farm out and also help you break the rules in certain ways. So this board is going to dictate how you play the game. And one of the first things that you'll have to do when you set up the game, which is very clever, is determine for the number of players you have which set of cards you're going to use. So there's different cards for three, four, five players. So we're going to use the four player set of cards. And we're going to assume we have a four player game. So we take all the cards that show for four players and we put them out here. And so the board is going to be different based upon the number of players you have. So to start the game, you're going to seed the board with appropriate markers. And so you'll just follow the instructions. This space shows two wood, so I put two wood on it. This one shows three wood, so I put three on it. The main way the game's going to go is on your turn, you're going to take one of your people and you can put them somewhere on the board. And you're going to claim that space and you'll get to do whatever's on that space. So if I want to move to that space and take the three wood, I put my guy down, I take the three wood. That's my turn. If you remember at the beginning of the game, you just start out with two people. So it's going to go pretty quickly early on. Everyone's just going to have two people to put on the board somewhere. If someone's gone there, someone else can't go there. That's the, that's the restriction. And so it's going to be the first person in gets to take advantage of that space. One of the spaces lets you become the starting player for next turn. So if your good choices always get taken away from you, well then put one of your people on starting player. And the next turn you will get beat the starting player as indicated by the starting player marker. Now at the end of the round, everyone will take back all of their pieces, and then you will fill the board again as needed. And so spaces that have an arrow on it, like this three wood with an arrow on it, are going to get three wood added to it. Which means if there was already three wood there, then you put another three wood on top of it. Spaces that just have a plus sign, like this, it says take one grain with a plus, you never add, it doesn't pile up there. It just means if you go there, then you're going to get to take one single grain for yourself. As the game goes on, there's going to be new abilities that come into play. And so, for example, for round one, before you start round one, you're going to take one of these four cards that say stage one, round one to four, and put it face up in the round one space. And that actually gives you an additional choice for the first round of play. And then before round two, you're going to take another one and add it in. Before round three, you'll add another. And before round four, you'll add another. And you'll continue like this until you've gone through 14 rounds. And so the game has 14 cards. They're all going to come out, but you don't know what order in which they'll come out. They'll come out in batches. You know all of the stage one cards will come out before anything else. And you know that the stage six card is going to come out last. But you don't know which one's going to come next. After every few rounds, there's going to be a harvest, as indicated at the end. And those harvests come more frequently as the game goes on. Harvests are good, and that's a chance to harvest grain and harvest vegetables from your fields. But harvests are bad in that you have to feed your people. You've got to produce two of these little food units for every person you have in your family. So while it might be fun to go out and make babies, you've got to feed them. Just like real life. So let me talk a little bit more in depth about the starting boards, just to give you an idea of what you're going to have. Um, that you get a food and that's going to accumulate because it has an arrow. That you get two clay, it'll accumulate because it has an arrow. Meaning if no one takes it this round, there'll be four clay there next round. That's one wood, two wood. One occupation, I haven't shown you what occupations are yet, but I will soon. This is how you're going to, one way to get an occupation. Your first and second occupation cost a food and additional ones cost two food. Take one reed, one stone, and one food. This one has a plus sign, which means it won't accumulate. You just take it when you go there. Build rooms. This is how you're going to enlarge your house. So to build onto your wooden hut, it costs five wood and two reeds. You can also build stables in this one. Two wood per stable. Take over starting player and get a minor improvement. I also haven't talked about those yet. Take a grain and put it in your personal supply. Plow a field. Take an occupation. The first one is free. An additional one costs one food. Now you may be saying, well, why is this one any different than this one? Well, this one's actually worse than this one. But the first person here blocks anyone else from taking that. And so someone else, if they want to do an occupation, may have to go there, which is going to be more expensive. It's going to cost more food. Day labor, take two food. And so a lot of these spaces have to do with collecting resources. Running through the other starting board, there's three wood, which accumulates, one clay, one reed, and one food, which accumulates. Now let me run through the 14 cards that will come out during the game. One sheep. That will accumulate as the game goes on. One major or minor improvement. Again, I'll talk about building improvements a bit later. Sow and or bake bread. Sow is how you'll plant vegetables in the fields. Remember earlier how I showed that you can have the plowed fields on your board? Well, when you take sow, then what it does is it allows you to take one wheat that you already have and put it into your field 
putting three in its stead. So you take one, you add two more to it, you put the stack of three there. Then every time you hit a harvest, you'll take the top one of those off. Whenever you sow, you can actually sow every field that you have available as long as you have appropriate vegetables or wheat to sow in those fields. You can do the same thing with vegetables. If you've gotten one vegetable, then you can sow and take a second vegetable from the bank and plant them both in your field and then you'll take those vegetables off over rounds of play. And or bake bread. Baking bread is something you can do with an oven. If you have an oven, you can choose the bake bread action and that's how you're going to convert this grain into food. Fences. Once this card is available, then you can start building fences. When you take that card, you can build as many fences as you'd like. When you build fences, you have to build complete pastures. You can't leave uncompleted pastures at the end of the fence building phase. But it's one word per fence. Those are the stage one cards. Now here are the stage two cards. Renovation. After renovation, so renovation is how you're going to take your house from a wood house to a brick house, or a brick house up to a stone house. And so wood to a clay hut is one reed plus one brick per room to turn it into a clay hut, and then a second time you can take it from a clay hut to a stone house. Also, and this means when it says after also, it means you have to do the after in order to get access to the also, which was different from the sow and or bake bread. And or meant you could do either one or both. The after also means you have to do this in order to get access to that second part. Family growth. Family growth is how you make babies. This is the making babies card. And so when you have a man and a woman, or actually in this game, this is an open-minded game. When you have two same-sex discs even in front of you, then you can choose family growth. You do have to have room in your house for them, which is how it's not like real life. Uh, if you have a, an empty room in the house, you can choose family growth. And so you make an extra baby. That baby will come into play for the next turn. You just, if, if you put your worker there, you put your baby on top of it. And then when you pick those up at the end of the round, you'll take your baby with you. Also, one minor improvement. One stone. That's the way stones will accumulate. And then we move into the stage three cards. Take a vegetable and put it in your personal supply. Vegetables don't come out till about halfway through the game. One wild boar. Oink, oink, oink. Scott, you're such a wild boar. One stone. This is how you're going to get stone in the game. One cattle. Works kind of like the wild boar again. Those are going to accumulate as the game goes on. Then we go on to the last few cards. Family growth, even without space in your home. Now in this case, you can be making babies even if you don't have a room for them. So it's the one time in the game you can pile in the kids. Plow a field and or sow. So this lets you not only create the field, but then also sow in that field right away. And finally, after renovation, also fences. So this lets you do both renovation and fences. This is the final card that's going to come out in the game. So there's only been one round of play where you'll even have the ability to put anything on that card. So as the game goes on, you're going to get more and more choices of what to do in the, in the game. You're also going to get more people you get to put out. So you start with two people. Usually people will typically have four folks in their family by the end of the game. It can be hard to do well with only two but you've got to feed them every harvest phase. So the more people you have, the more mouths you are to feed. So as the game goes on, it's going to take longer to take the turns because there's going to be lots and lots of choices out there for you to put your people on. Harvests will occur regularly throughout the game after rounds 4, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 14. As the game goes on, the harvests get closer together, which means you've got to work to get food ready for your family. It's important to note that you're only going to have one round between these last two harvests, so you'd better be saving up food up to that point. Now, during the harvest phase, you've got to take care of your family. Here's the way that works. First, you harvest off of your fields. You get to take the top grain or vegetable from all of your fields. Second, you've got to feed your family. For every family member disc, you have to come up with two food. And so these are your food. So you have to discard two food. If you are short, you can eat a grain or a vegetable as you're missing one. So that would be enough for me to keep my people going. Third, you will breed animals. In any pasture where there are two or more animals of the same type, if there is space, they will produce one new baby. And that's the third thing that happens during the harvest phase. If you cannot feed your people, you have to take a begging card. The begging card is a minus three points at the end of the game. and That's big in this game. This game is usually won or lost by just a few points. Let's talk about the major improvements. Now these you can play in the game when you choose a major improvement space. So, 
These are the ones that are most commonly taken by people, the fireplace and the cooking hearth, because these allow you to turn many of your items into food. Um, the fireplace, at any time, you can convert goods to food as follows. One vegetable is two food, one sheep is two food, wild boar is two food, cattle is three food. You can also choose the bake bread action and turn one grain into two food. This is very useful to have. And you'll want to get one of these in order to turn your animals into food. Notice, however, there's only four of them. So if you're playing a five-player game, someone's going to have to get creative. Also, what will happen is this costs two brick. This one costs three brick. There's no difference between them other than the first player to grab it gets to pay one fewer brick. These costs either return fireplace or four brick. So if you buy this fireplace, later on you can take the major improvement space and then turn it in and get the cooking hearth for free. Or you can just pay the four bricks outright and take it. The cooking hearth is a more efficient form of the fireplace. There are other major improvements as well, and based upon what you seem to be getting a lot of, you may want to consider those. If you're getting a lot of reeds, this one lets you turn reeds into food and also gives you extra points at the end of the game for reeds. And so the cost for these things is up here in the corner, and this is the number of victory points they give you at the end of the game. There are ten of these major improvements, and once they're gone, they're gone. These are some of the minor improvements in the game. When you play the game, you're going to get a hand of seven of these, and only you can play those, and each one changes the game in a different way. Similarly, there are occupations, and each player is going to get seven of these. These also change the way you play the game. And so what's interesting about this, and this is what makes the game really neat, is when you start the game, you're going to get 14 cards, seven occupations, and seven minor improvements. Only you have access to those, and you're going to look at them, and during the game, you can play these things to help yourself out. And what it means is when you start each game, you're going to have to make new plans. You can't just use the same strategy you did last time. You've got to look and decide what cards you want. You'll probably only get out two or three occupations and minor improvements during the game, unless you're really focusing on one of them. All of these cards have a letter E on them because they're in the basic first deck, the easy deck. But when you're ready to kick the game up a notch, BAM, you use the BAM deck. No, the I deck for interactive. And this is a whole different set of minor occupations and careers that make the game more interactive with each other. So these have things that interact with each other, interact with the board. Or K for the complex deck. It's K because in German, the K worked. Anyway, um, now it's just the special K. And so this is the complex deck. This is another set of occupations. It's suggested that you only play with one deck at a time, that you don't mix all these up and make one big deck, and I would agree with that. I found that the time this game breaks is when you mix all these up and you deal things out, and you can come up with some really crazy combinations of cards. It's much better if you play with everyone using cards from one of the three decks, based upon what type of game you want to have. Now let me talk a little bit more about some of these cards in depth. First up in the top corner will be the cost. And so this will be, this costs one wood to be able to create the fishing rod. The E just tells you it's from this basic deck. And it tells you how that works. And this one, whenever you use the fishing action space, you receive one additional food. From round eight, you receive two additional food. So what this means is that for you now, if you have this card, you're going to be doing that fishing action a lot, which may affect other people and their actions. Now this card has the cost of one brick. It also gives you one victory point at the end of the game. That's what this shows you. And this is a simple fireplace. This gives you the ability to get a fireplace, like one of those major improvements I talked about earlier. Turn rest plow. Now this one has a prerequisite. The prerequisite could be written up here. In this case, it requires two occupations. Cost is three wood. Once during the game, when you use either the plow one field or plow one field and or sow action, you can plow three fields instead of one. So that's pretty powerful. But it only works once, and you can't use it again, and you have to use it after you've developed two occupations. This symbol means once you've used it, pass the card. So this is field, one food. When you play this, immediately plow one field. Pretty basic card, and once you've done it, you're going to pass that on to the next player. Now you're going to play these cards whenever you would choose a minor improvement space from the board. We saw a number of those when, when we were looking at the board earlier. Now let's talk about the occupations. The occupations are similar. You have the tutor. The one plus means you use this in a game of one or more people. Some of them will say three plus or four plus. This one plus means if you have one or more people, you'll use this. Tutor. At the end of the game, you receive one bonus point for each occupation that you play after this one. So this is when you might want to play first. This little symbol means you could get bonus points on this card, and this will give you extra points if you play this occupation first. Hedge Keeper. Whenever you build at least one fence, you can build three additional fences without paying any wood. And so, this allows you, if you choose this, then you'll want to get it out early in order to build more fences.
the master builder. Once during the game, at any time after your house reaches at least five rooms, you can extend it by one room at no cost. So this guy would be really, if you get him, you probably want to try and build a six building house. And that's going to be worth a lot of points at the end of the game, especially if you take it up to stone. So your strategy is going to be partially determined by which of these cards you get. Wooden Hut Builder, at the end of the game, you receive one bonus point for each room in your wooden hut. So, in this player, would not want to go beyond a wooden hut. So you can see how with the game, you're going to get seven of these careers and seven of these minor improvements. And it's very different based upon what you get. Here are some of the cards from the interactive deck. Wooden Path, the player with the most valuable street receives two bonus points when scoring. There are other cards out there. The Paved Road that costs five stone is more valuable than the Clay Path that costs three clay, which is more valuable than the Wooden Path. This is the Wooden Path, but there are other cards in the game. So in this interactive card, other players' cards may keep this card from scoring for you. Uh, the Corn Profiteer, you can convert one grain to three food at any time. Any other player can stop this by paying you two food to buy, to buy the grain for themselves. If more than one player offers, you choose one of them. So, these are the interactive deck cards. They have the players interacting with each other a lot more. These are from the complex deck. As you can see, the paragraphs get longer. Educator, whenever another player plays an occupation card, you can pay three food to play one yourself. From your fourth occupation on, it only costs you two food. So, when other players play occupations, you can pay food to get, a, get some of your own out as well. Pelts. For each animal that you slaughter and return to the general supply, you may place one food from your personal supply in one of your rooms. You may have a maximum of one food in each room. You cannot use these food anymore, but each is worth one bonus point at the end of the game. So the complex cards are always more involved. I wouldn't start out with these on my first game. So after you play through 14 rounds, in each round of play, players will put out all their people to claim spaces on the board, taking the stuff. After the 14th round of play, you'll score. I showed you earlier how to score. You'll use this little sheet. You'll fill out how many points you got for fields, pastures, grain, vegetables, sheep, wild boar, cattle, unused spaces on the board, that's a negative, fenced in stables. If you upgraded your house, your family members, points for any bonus cards you have and any bonus points you got, and that determines your points at the end of the game. And that, my friends, is Agricola. <laughs> well, that's Agricola. Is it a good game? Yeah, it is. I like it a lot. I like the fact that each time you play, you've got to replan your strategy. You can't just go in and say, I'm going to do these things. After you play, you want to go in and try something different. There's so many different things to pursue in the game, and you have to pursue several of them to win, that each time you play, it's a different feeling. There is a family game for Agricola, and it uses uh, the board and the cards with this family symbol on it. In the family game, you don't use any of the occupations and none of the minor improvements, only the major improvements. If you're a serious gamer, you can learn it with the family game, but you should move on and try it with the cards the next time. If you're a casual gamer, you're playing with kids, the family game will certainly give you some challenge, but it won't be nearly as exciting as the full game with all the cards. This is a picture of Hannah, who is the daughter of Paul, aka Noosh, on Board Game Geek. Paul has customized the Agricola set with all sorts of little sculpted animals and wheat and people, and Hannah loves to play farm. And This picture captures what I love about Agricola, is it allows me to play farm as well. And with that, well, I'm going to get back to enjoying what I have left of the summer, because here in Syracuse we get a lot of snow, so I might as well enjoy this sun while I can. Bye-bye! <sighs>if you really want to pimp your Agricola, you could get some sort of animals to replace the ones that you had. These are counting animals that I got at Target, and three packages of this will replace your animals appropriately. And so it's got the brown cows, but the pigs are pink and they need to be black, so you'd have to paint those. And there's goats that will work well as sheep, but they're gray, and so you need to paint them white. So I decided to do that. I went out, got some spray paint, painted them, but they were taking a while to dry. So I set them out in the sun. Little did I know that our lawn people were going to come by while I was out eating. So I ended up with, well... Um, realistic barnyard animals. Maybe I should put these on eBay and make a profit.